All right, so uh, what we're gonna talk about is uh, David Koresh or the whole Waco incident, which happened in 1993. Um, the numbers vary on how many people died. You've probably like, seen images or pictures of this event happening with like the house on fire and stuff like that. I mean, you know, it's, it's a very interesting situation. And the more we dove into it, we started, you know, coming up with questions like, huh, that's a little odd, that's a little odd, you know, just uh, tactics that the FBI used and um, AFT used are very interesting but yeah so we're gonna talk about that right now so johnny what do you want to talk about first you want to just do like a overview of the whole thing or do you want to like talk um, about parts of it i mean you can do if you want to do an overview of it okay so basically it started out david crush basically got a hold of the branch davidians church or a group um he ended up getting in a suite with the um the founder or like one of the high um, Ups. Yeah, it I think was it was low, low, Lois Rotem. Something like that. She was about 60 plus years old. In her 60s, yeah. Uh, she was <clears> up <throat> there, and there's um, uh, there are rumors that um, David Koresh, who was a lot younger at the time, was uh, seeing her romantically. And that's how he got in and got the church. But he ended up getting up. 24 people of the congregation and moved them out into like, the woods and stuff, and they lived in campers, trailers, stuff like, or buses, emptied out buses, and they ended up building a little like cabin area and then moving back and um, got in a firefight with some of the original people there. Um, and then that guy, the son of the, of the lady he was seeing, ended up going in jail for a while. And that's the last we kind of heard of him. We didn't look much into that after that. Yeah, he, so, so I guess he, when he showed up, he immediately like built this this cult of following around him where people yep. are just enamored by him and uh he ended up competing with 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 that woman's son and he really wanted to he, he didn't really say he wanted to be the, the, the next leader but he really wanted to take over a lot of the responsibilities that, that the leader had previously done yeah and yeah. so <clears throat> He took like 20 or 30 members and they, they went 90 miles away in Palestine, Texas. Mm -hmm. And he started a small uh, group there, but it was, it, it seemed like they had intentions of returning. It was like a temporary uh, thing. So well, they were, remember the, um, I forgot the other guy's name, but he wanted to have that contest of raising that person from the dead. So he dug up a casket. He's like, hey, Koresh. Let's go see if we can raise this person from the dead and see who wins this thing. Which I either he was crazy enough where he believed he could raise this person from the dead or had like a spring or something to like bring the body up. Like it's alive. Yeah, assuming he didn't have some yeah. type of some type of contraption to so try then, to do it. He he obviously otherwise he he would have had to have believed that yeah. he was capable of doing that. Yeah, because then it would just be end in a stalemate. <clears throat> but so David Koresh and about uh, a group of like six plus people ended up going to the cops or whatever, the local authorities, and said, hey, this guy dug up a grave that's illegal, you should arrest him. And the police officers or whatever, the authorities like, well, you have to get solid evidence. They're like, okay, we'll go get the evidence. So they end up going over there and they bring guns and stuff because the, um, the other guy, I keep forgetting his name, I'm sure I looked up his name. Uh, you want to look it up real quick? Yeah, go ahead. Um, they ended up going over <coughs> there and they ended up um, having a little gunfight or something. and. I think somebody was killed, maybe not. There yeah, I think someone was, I think people were, were injured. It said when the police showed up that the guy that the, whom we don't remember his name, that he was uh, behind a tree. He was injured behind a tree when the, when the mm -hmm. police showed up. But there, there was a, sh a shootout broke out. So yeah. There was a fire. So then that guy ended up going to jail and then David Koresh moved back into the, George Roden, I'm sorry. George Roden. Roden. George that's Roden. right. George Roden was the guy who got shot. So he was the son of, of, yeah. of Lois Roden, mm -hmm. the, the leader. Yep. And George Roden dug up the grave and he was the one that believed he could bring this person back from the dead. Which, Which I think makes it more, I think that's what makes it all the more interesting because it, at least there you have someone that as much as we just dislike him he clearly believed that he was capable of doing that that says a lot about him it does it does it shows that he wasn't necessarily i mean he if he believed that he wasn't a con man there's a difference if he believed he could do that then he was actually under the delusion that he was doing good mm -hmm. 
so then that happens, uh, Koresh takes over and he uh, starts stockpiling weapons and he starts, you know, talking about the end of days and things like that. Um, end up talking about that and he ends up getting a hold of, I guess, grenades. Like a, a UPS driver like was delivering something and a box broke open and there were grenades, like empty grenade, like shells where you have to like make it yourself, like homemade or something they're saying. Not actual like grenades, grenades, but they have they look at the casing of the outside of the grenade. Um, so then the um, ATF ended up finding out about this, started staking the house and stuff like that, and getting a warrant for his arrest. And they showed up with SWAT police. I don't know how many people showed up originally, but <clears throat> you know it ended up getting to like 900 plus law enforcement on this house. Um, he had a group of um, I think it was a around 170 or 17 and like 46 of them were kids or something like that um it ended up they ended up raiding the place and their fire started nobody knows who started it but a fire started when they started putting tear gas in on the 51st day which is a long time for a standoff because most standoffs only last six to eight hours so this was a lot longer yeah that's part that really surprises me is is that you know they showed up he was talking about in the video how they showed up and demanded that he <laughs> he exited the home, but they had yeah. on multiple occasions been watching him, according to him, jogging into town or picking up milk or groceries in town. Mm -hmm. And if their if their goal was simply to arrest him or to question him, uh, it could have been done simply. But I mean, once the, once he knew there's 900 people outside, obviously he refused to to leave the home. Oh yeah, absolutely. So we're going to talk about some things we thought very interesting about the whole situation. So John, you want to start on some interests you have, some questions that arose learning think, about this? I think the part about that I found, I mean obviously as we start reading about it, the thing that seems the most out is no matter what source you go to, mm -hmm. I mean whether you go to the New York Times or whether you actually look at reports, mm -hmm. it seems like all of the numbers are inconsistent. I mean, not necessarily yeah. significantly, but there always there's 22 children, there's 24 children. Yeah, there's and, 25. Yeah, yeah, there's 25. And then the, the part that, if, if we're really being honest, the part I find the most strange out of the entire thing is that even if we find something that horrible, even if we're, we're offended by something, like him having multiple lives and having these things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, it, you may even think it's unethical, but... He didn't have. I mean, they're they're not legally, they're not legally acknowledged marriages. Yeah. So we had he had a legal wife named Rachel, and her and her parents lived there in the compound. And then he had these these other these other wives, but the whole the whole idea behind all his accusations against him were all hearsay. And so, what kind of worries me about that is, obviously, if he's in there and he's abusing children and he's doing all these horrible things. Then, then he's he's breaking the law and, and that, that's a problem. But what I find strange is they it was just purely based off people's people's hearsay. And when they did investigations, they didn't come back with any evidence of it. Yeah. They weren't. They weren't able, we we don't want to live in a world where your neighbor could simply say, "Yeah, I think he's abusing his child," and that's enough for you to get in trouble. That that's not yeah. the society we live in. So he his first. Um I believe he was 20. He ended up um, seeing like a 14 year old girl, had a kid with her. And the father of that 14 year old girl said, you can't ever come back here. This is way back in his life. I yeah, think. he was 19. So. He was 19 or something like that, yeah. And then uh, his next wife, that he guess he had two or three kids with was- Well, he, only, he, he was only married once, like legally. Yeah, years. married once to that, um, to the girl. And they had a few kids, but then everyone in the congregation, once they turned 14, I guess they got a star or something saying, you know, you have, you are now in, you know, Red Robin of, that he can yeah, sleep that he, were, he would be able, he would be able to sleep with them once they turned 14. Yeah. But again, that's the thing too, is, you know, we, we're not, we haven't looked that far into this, but I know that that, it said there was a, a physician at, at the Texas Children's Hospital mm -hmm. that interviewed, I mean, that his team had interviewed like 20, 19 out of like 20 something children. Yeah. And 
so they, it says that they were all talking about abuse that they suffered under them, mm-hmm. but it didn't, you know, go any deeper, like what, how consistent their stories were and everything. I know it sounds terrible when I say that. But well, I'm, the abuse was more like if you spill milk, you're, you're going to get it dismantled. Right, right. But what I'm saying is there, mm-hmm. that there was, it said that there was sexual abuse that was, that was discussed. And so all, all I'm arguing is that we, d- we don't want... I think a lot of people are quick to say, oh, he's doing this and he's doing that, but that's not how that works. Your neighbor can't just say, oh, I think he's abusing his kids or I think he's doing that, and then you get hauled off and arrested and people mm-hmm. kick in your door. That's not the type of world we want to live in. And so if there's no... They did investigations and they never... They were never able to recover any mm-hmm. evidence. So mm-hmm. even if he is doing it, you have to have evidence. And if they do investigations, which they did, and they, they don't come back with any, with any evidence, well, then you... The, the whole premise behind the FBI raiding the home was that they were they kept repeating their concern. Um, they just continuously reiterate their concern for those children and their safety, and these children are being abused and everything. But they had multiple investigations and didn't bring back any evidence. So mm-hmm. if you truly believe that, if you believe that there's children being abused there, well, you have to get evidence. You can't just say, well, we tr- there was no evidence, but we still believe it. You, that's not how it works. You don't mm-hmm. believe it. You have to find evidence. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and two years before the, you know, when he died from the gunshot wound, aka trapped in there and burned alive, um, it was like two years before that there were people coming out, ex people of the community, saying that you know he there was um, abuse of kids, things of that nature. Mm-hmm. So they looked into that, but they couldn't find any evidence. And the whole time you you watch any documentary, you see interviews or even Bill Clinton when he's talking, like, you know, kids were getting abused, things like that, we had to step in and take care of it. And then they end up dropping 400 gan- uh, cans of tear gas in this place. And here's another yeah, thing. That's so, the inconsistency. They're concerned about the children, but they'll drop tear gas in there, knowing that every single child is in the room that they're dropping the tear gas in. And, and this, is, this is what I find interesting. So it ended up, it got burned down. Um, Around 79 people died, 22 of them were kids, to 25. There was a lot of variance in that as well. Um, then the, there were about, um, I think it was 251 guns or around there that were found. Like a lot of them were found in the vault. Some of them were found in that like first like house area. It's like closed, like that little circle. They were found in the front and then there's about 22 found just laying around on dead bodies and things of that nature. But I just find it interesting. So they knew what kind of stuff he had. Because he was getting the stuff from the UPS drivers, saw their names. They knew what kind of stuff he had. Even FBI agents went there and looked. Like, there were two FBI agents in that video. He's like, yeah, I left them in my house and stuff like that. Nice guys. I don't know why they wouldn't have, you know, got me when I was taking a walk or going to Walmart, he even says. Yeah, the like, interview of him with the- Having been shot and covered in blood, yeah. it's all cool, calm, and collected. Yeah, he shot, he, you know, there's bullet hole going through, you can see it. He's like, I don't know why you wouldn't have picked me up when I was running up and down this road, going for walks, going into town. Like, why did you do it this way? Coming with military gunfire and all that kind of stuff. Now, there is a thing, who opened, who shot first? It sounds like a police shot, like a warning shot, and then people started shooting. But that's... But please say that the other people started well, I wanna, Even before we even talk about who shot first, so I, 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 mean, I don't, I don't want to be a dead person. I want to kind of go back just a few steps and say that, you know, if, you, you know, if your kid goes to the police department and says, oh, mm-hmm. I've been abused, well, then they can come to your, I believe, they can come to your house and they could arrest you. They just, you, they, they're, 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 it's pointless. Well, they need evidence, though. No, they no, need I'm, to see, yeah. Well, no, I'm saying in principle they could arrest you, but yeah. they need evidence to keep you, to, to have it. They have to, so they're not going to show up to arrest you. That's my point, unless they have evidence. Like, in principle, they could just show up and arrest you, but they're only going to be able to hold you so long if they don't have any evidence. Yeah. But typically, one hopes, they just show up at your house and they already have you. They have enough evidence, so they show up to arrest you. Mm-hmm. But... In his case, they didn't have evidence. They just had hearsay. So, so they're demanding he leaves the home because they do have good evidence that he stockpiled weapons, right? Yeah. But what's the part I'm saying is odd is they're claiming their 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 main concern are those children, and then they 
pump CS gas or whatever it's called in home, knowing that all those children are there, it just seems that that's the part that I just couldn't wrap my I cannot wrap my head around that. That just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah, I think that's one of the things that really is crazy to me where you see like the very difference of like we did it for the kids. Yeah, but well, yeah. they're trying to force him out of the house, but they, like you said, they could, they, there's, they mm -hmm. knew his, unless they never were watching him, they knew his habits, his rituals, what he did. He went into town. Yeah, but here's the thing. They knew what kind of stuff he had. He had gas masks for everyone, except they don't make gas masks for kids. So they're going to know they have gas masks. So what's the point of using tear gas if they have gas masks and there's no gas masks for kids and tear gas is bad, like, very bad for me. Like they can die in yeah. minutes. I, I love you with all my heart, but I was going to say before, I, I don't know if they could have known that he had the gas mask because they didn't even necessarily know what weapons he had. Because it wasn't like they couldn't, it wasn't like they went on Amazon. This was in the 90s and saw what he's ordering. And, and obviously people don't order, get, or at least don't order. They're still getting Amazon, paperwork. He was getting stuff from um, EPS. Yeah. EPS. Yeah. But, and they also had FBI agents in there who saw all the weapons. Doesn't that seem, I mean, I think, and we're just kind of shooting from the hip here. And, and this is, this is just a theory. It. It's not a theory. I'm just oh, saying yeah. we're just having fun. We don't want to talk about it's that. a very simple conclusion to know, hey, he's getting all this military stuff. I mean, you must have seen a gas in this. Well, here's another one, too. Here's what's interesting. They show, you know, oftentimes when, like, when you talk about something like this, if you just mm -hmm. come up with a close enough analogy, it kind of illuminates some of the parts that are more difficult to see. So like, for example, yeah, yeah. when we picture him in the compound, that's one thing. So let's just put him in a normal, typical house, like a, a three bedroom house, okay? Mm -hmm. and imagine he's in there with 20 children. And imagine that they're showing up because the, the, the ATF, the FBI, whatever, the police, they're showing up to arrest him because they have this just enormous amount of evidence that he's stockpiling weapons yeah, in his yeah. home, right? and he refuses to come out. Well, even if he refuses to come out for days and days and days, right? At what point does it seem logical, knowing that there's 20 children in there, to pump CS gas in there? Even if they went into his, his driveway and tried to get into the, the side door and three officers were shot, right? It still seems like to me the concern is always the fact that there's 20 innocent people in there. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they just figured that was the best. I, I mean, again, we're not, we're not military strategists. We're not attorneys. I don't know. We're just having fun. But it just seems just logically and ethically that seems like the, one of the least sophisticated options you could come up with. Yeah, and here's another perspective. It's like, so David Koresh, um, interesting, when he was, his mom had him when she was 14. And the dad left, and then he got another dad that was abusive and stuff like that. And uh, in school, they called him um, Mr. Mr. Retardo, and yeah. he had dyslexia. He was really bad um, at reading and stuff like that. And he went into slower classes, and he was a very smart kid. He just didn't do that much in school, so he didn't have his confidence. He had a stuttering effect, I guess, and he was really bad at speaking. But he would listen. He ended up getting a radio, and he oh, really loved yeah. music. So then he started playing music, and then he started listening to like uh, he got he started reading the Bible as well. And as he was reading, he found like, some religious speakers on the radio, and he would like sort of sound like them and try to talk like them. And he noticed that his stutter went away when he talked in that like religious talk and things of that nature. So as a kid, if you're going through your whole life getting bullied like crazy, being called. <laughs> Mr. Ricardo all the time. It's so, it's, I just want to acknowledge, it's so difficult to say that with a straight face, and yet at the same time, when, when we're clearly thoughtful enough to know that a child being called that every single day, that's terrible. Yeah. So just for clar clarification yeah. purposes, we're not laughing, so we're insensitive. But just means. the mindset of someone like that, you spend your whole life with this problem, and you know, you must be trying to work on it. Like, you have this stuttering problem, it must be bad. You're a very smart guy, you have these smart ideas, you just can't get out. Yeah, because everyone people. they interviewed said that he was he was intelligent, mm -hmm. well, he was well-spoken. Yeah. He, he spoke clearly, and he just was stuttering. Yeah, he, he would light up a room, a lot of people would say, later on. But you have that problem, and you're trying to constantly fix it. And you get this book, you know, and there's like passages you read and you tailor it to your life. And it's like, hey, you know, if I listen to these preachers, I lose this stutter. 
I mean, that must be a powerful thing. You're you must be like, yeah. okay, this God's sending me on a path. And if we're being honest, many a critical thinker would still fall for that. I mean, if you, you're struggling with a stutter for all these years, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you start listening to these televangelists or uh, evangelists on the radio and everything, and you're starting to emulate their preaching style, well, just because you're so, your, your focus is so honed in on imitating them that you actually lose some of your own uh, voice, you lose that stutter. He, he's, yeah. he, you know, it's to me that's sort of like someone with an English accent. Sometimes they can do our accents so well that they can, in some sense, have both an English accent and a non. And they could imitate yeah. us, yeah. and so he's just imitating them. And just like you, an English person with a thick accent imitates you and I, and they lose their English accent because they're imitating us. Mm -hmm. He basically lost his his stutter by imitating other people, those yeah. preachers which seems like like you're saying it seems like a sign from god I and mean, you could see why someone would believe that i could see why i could possibly believe that in a situation mm -hmm. and uh he also changed his name after he went to um california right no no he, For, went, he went to the middle east oh i'm sorry yeah he he went he went on a, a trip to the middle east and this is kind of where he got the idea that he was um a uh, self-proclaimed prophet. So yeah, so Wikipedia says Vernon Howell filed a petition in California State Superior Court in Pomona uh, to legally change his name for what he called publicity and business purposes to David Koresh. Mm -hmm. uh, David being King David and then uh, Koresh being uh, that the biblical Cyrus name? the second of Persia or Cyrus the Great mm -hmm. or um, Cyrus the Elder by the, uh, the Egyptian or no, no, by the Greeks. Um, the Greeks called him Cyrus the Elder. So he ended up, that's where he got his name from. So then he starts going on this, you know, starts slowly going into like, hey, I am a prophet. You know, self-proclaimed prophet, that's who I am. And then he starts talking about the end of days and analyzing revelations and stuff like that. And the seven seals was a big one. Because, um, you know, during that 51-day standoff, he's like, well, let me finish, you know, deciphering the seven seals. Yeah, so he's claiming that he is the, the lamb that's mentioned in the book of Revelation, that he's going to interpret the, the seven seals. And, mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. so, and let's look at from, because what we want to talk about the idea of how does somebody get in that situation? How do you get in a situation where you are basically control these people? Like he told them they couldn't masturbate, they couldn't, you know, he could have sex with their wives at any time. And there are probably other rules and things of that nature. I know there was hard discipline and stuff on kids, but I mean, you, you see that a lot. I'm not saying that it's, you know, you should do that. I'm just saying you see that. Yeah, you're lot. just simply saying you're not. You, and if you if you're the not FBI use that as the the number one motive to go in there, guns of blazing is. Yeah, because that's the point. You're not. No one's advocating. You're just simply saying it's not. It doesn't stand out. You could have walked in any direction for a few blocks and found any other home full of people that paddled their children in Texas in the '90s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So because it was, it was per in fact, it's le I, be I believe that it, it's legal. And, and it's certainly legal in some states in the United States for school public schools to, to paddle children. So. Still? Yeah, I believe yeah. so. I believe so. And when, when you really think about it, it's odd that that was, they couldn't come up with any more clever and well thought out excuses for the way they handled everything. Mm -hmm. And I just remember watching one of the documentaries that FBI agent saying, my worst fear during when it's burning is you know, what if he goes in a tunnel somewhere, comes out three days later, just like Jesus arising and having millions of followers after that. And as I'm watching that, I'm like, dude, there's like 22 to like 25 kids in there getting burned alive and that's your biggest fear? Yeah. That right there? Yeah, I thought the same thing. But isn't it, isn't it sort of interesting though? I mean, I know, I don't know if this, this topic interests you, but it's just interesting to me that we want to live, even when someone's doing something you don't agree with, we want to live in a society where you're not going to necessarily want them to get in trouble for it because then who's going to come and take away your, I mean, the, if people willingly want to co mm -hmm. live together and be, oh, this is my husband or this is my wife and it's five men and one woman or five yeah, yeah. women and one man. I mean, as long as it's not legal marriages where they're all getting insurance benefits and everything, if, 
people just want to live together and call themselves, I mean, it almost seems like a, a freedom of speech issue. If you want to move into a home, buy a house, and five women move in, and you're going to call them all your wives, I mean, there's nothing unethical about that. And if you want to have children with all of them, I don't think there's, a, I mean, I don't, don't know what I'm talking about, but I don't think that's even necessarily legal. And then, you know, mm -hmm. just because some neighbors say, I mean, we're clearly playing using the Socratic method here. We don't yeah. necessarily, and, we're not defending, I'm just saying, I, I'll defend it, whether I agree with someone or not. I'll defend anybody who's going to get their house torn down based simply off of the accusations of people. Even if it's former members there, so that they're going to the police and saying all these things, you still need evidence. I mean, yeah. what did the sheriff say when he just simply walked in and said, yeah, this guy exhumed a grave. The sheriff says, yeah, but I need a photo. Mm -hmm. But when it's flipped the other way around and people are coming out saying, yeah, David Crash is paddling his kids, David Crash is doing this, David Crash is doing that. And, and they don't at all seem concerned about having photographs or videos and just straight to Taryn, you know, kicking in his door and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so. I think it's uh, Voltaire who says, I might disapprove of what you say, but I will fight to the death so you have the right to disapprove. And that I, sound, I think that, that sounds like a Voltaire quote, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good one I like from Voltaire. Um, but yeah, I think a big thing, another thing I have a question about is why did it get done the way it did? I mean, they're at Mar our, um, Mount Carmel, right? Mm -hmm. They're there. They have this compound. They have like 70 plus acres, you know. It's not like they're in the city or anything like that. If there's any like houses near them. There are a few, but they're very far apart. And you know, they go there. Like, why didn't you pick him up when he's walking down the side of the road? You know, was it would have been the same situation if it wasn't this religious background? If it was just a group of people just getting guns? Like, if it was just one big family living on a farm or a few farms all next to each other, would it? You know the. FBI like the one I'm working AFT. on saving up money to start yeah yeah like would that have batted an eye was it the religious thing involved with it was it just everything combined like why did this get blown out of proportion or was it blown out of proportion do you think they did they did what they had to do I mean it doesn't it certainly doesn't look like they planned anything <laughs> it, it really does it looks like everything like it looks like it, a whole ton of people all making decisions and not communicating with each other instead of a small group of people calling the shots and mm -hmm. controlling everything. And, and again, I know it sounds inconvenient, but they could, I mean, so it was weird enough that they didn't get him when he's going in town, all that, right? They had to get him at his house. But what's even yeah. stranger is, so even after 51 days, even after this unprecedented, this, this, this whole siege, it would have been, they could have just waited him out. I mean, they're not going to starve themselves to death. I feel like he, he eventually would have came out. And yeah. he, they were communicating with him during all this time. And he never once said, I'm going to heart, I'm gonna harm these kids, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. He just simply was preaching to them. Yeah, and I get that, you know, during the firefight when it first started out, four um, AFT agents were killed. And no. I believe six of the Branch Davidians were killed. Yeah. So, you know, if you're, you're, this goes to more like group dynamics, you know, if somebody in your group gets hurt, these, they're the bad people, you know, they're awful. I mean, Koresh lived in that place for 10 years, 10 plus years probably. He knew a lot of these people for a long time. It's like, oh, well, six of my friends just got killed. You know, I was talking about the end of days, how the religious are going to have to fight off the army of, um, what was the army? The army of battle? The army of, um, do you remember that? They're talking about Yeah, the, it's like on the tip of my tongue, but the army of David or something, not like that. Mm -hmm. This army would come of non-believers and try to take, take him down. And he yeah. believed that, you know, he, I mean, you go to church, you listen to music and stuff like that, you hear them, you hear him speak about this stuff. And then you look out one day and you see 700 people, 900 people, helicopters, tanks, oh, military. Yeah. That's just going to confirm aid, everything like, that you think. That's gonna be like, well, what's going on? Like, you know, because they didn't they didn't kill people. They just stockpiled weapons, which again is a bad thing. I'm not saying that you know right. they shouldn't have been looked at. You should definitely look at people who are stockpiling, you know, around 251 guns. But I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't. The and the part that, that that's also strange too is like I said, if they could have. 
he's refusing to come out. And the best, the best possible thing they could come up with was putting tear gas in the building, knowing that all those those women and children were in there. Mm-hmm. And you would have thought they would have sent, you know, re- I think people were just afraid to get hurt. They could have sent a negotiator in there or whatever. I mean, I, I've heard of negotiators being sent in tenser situations than that, even having known that federal agents were shot. I mean, they were on the phone with them. They could have said, if we send someone in there to talk to you, are you going to harm them? And mm-hmm. just attempt them. Yeah. Because in the, video, in the video that I saw, even after the federal agents were shot, he didn't seem like he was poised to shoot again. He seemed like he was like, hey, I'm sorry that happened. He didn't even acknowledge whether who, who shot first. Yeah, and he, he's even shot. He yeah, got, he shot. Because he went outside and they were shooting. So he's outside, you know, looking at all these guns probably, and someone gets, someone shoots, then he gets shot, he gets back inside. It's like, what is going on? And I, I don't know. It seems to know. me like, even putting aside our suspicions with the horrible things he's doing, putting yeah. aside you know, the things he does, he doesn't clearly doesn't share our social values, but at the same time, we should defend his right to do that. Mm-hmm. It seems like an excessive display of force, like a show-off thing, but we're going to just kick in the doors and take down this religious fanatic. Mm-hmm. And So let's take, let's take a scenario out where, let's say there are no guns. And, you know, you had these sort of, talks of child abuse like years ago and there's nothing now because everyone they interviewed after that said oh no he was he was good yeah the kids you know I guess nowadays did get disciplined very hard for you know spilling milk and things of that nature or crying too loud you know now you see it's crazy but back then you know it was seen okay you know even 15-20 years ago it was seen as okay yeah, we're just saying it, he wasn't doing any as far as that goes he wasn't engaging in anything that that was abnormal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's now let's leave the kid scenario and the guns, but take out that dogma of end of times. Do you think it would have happened? Do you think the FBI still would have come over, or do you think it was just the perfect storm of all those things? Because if you look at any of those things in and of themselves. The only one I see bringing that much military force over is for the guns, of course. But all the other ones, it's like, you know, you have a preacher, some guy living in a, you know, a little build, a building, a few other buildings around it, you know, talking about the end of days to like a group of uh, 117 people. Yeah. yeah, helicopters, like 20 local police, like 30 U.S. military personnel, 600 mm-hmm. something. And to be honest, like looking at some of those pictures, like did you see the one of like the, um, one of the guys like going in on a ladder on the roof like leaning in shooting in the windows and he got shot i think he's one of the guys that got killed but you know it's like you know it, why would you start advancing on the house you know like i'm you curious how they've done nothing back and just you, you would think i mean obviously i think that the negotiators tried to say hey let the let let all these people out let all these children out or whatever but even then they said that one of the one, women that were saved jumped from a two-story building, mm-hmm. or jumped from a burning two-story building, yeah. and then turned around and ran right back in the bottom. And when they went to grab her, she said, leave me alone. She wanted to apparently want, and so she, she, she didn't want to burn to death on the top floor, but she was content to go up to the bottom floor and burn to death in there. I don't remember that. And uh, like, I, it was, uh, it was in a, one of the court cases afterwards, one of the oh, okay. FBI agents that, that saved her or whatever. And you know, when you think about that, it wouldn't have done much good because if he would have said, you know, let the children out or whatever, or I was gonna say, if he would have said, let these adults out, most of them would have stayed, but they still could have sent the children out. Some children did get out, but mm-hmm. I feel like they spent so much more time trying to aggressively force him out than trying to yeah. handle it calmly. Well, what was it, 12, 13 of the kids were actually his? Yeah. Yeah, I think which is crazy. Yeah, it was like thirteen or fourteen kids were his. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. So over half the kids in there were his. I mean, he let you know a few out. And Maybe that's out. the ones he let out. The other twelve. Yeah. <laughs> but that I think that's interesting. He he also you know people were leaving and stuff like that. Like that one guy. He's like hey, once it was on fire. You know, I broke through this wall. I rolled down. You know the um, 
the roof landed on the ground and I was like, I thought I was gonna get shot, but. Yeah. Cause I, I think it, poor communication. And here's another thing they, the police did. Is that, they, not to interrupt, that guy also said he didn't know what the children were. Yeah. That was the first thing I asked him to where the children were at and he said he didn't know and he honestly, he said he didn't know. So, yeah. So taking him at his word, he didn't know. Mm -hmm. And another thing the um, FBI and the AFT did for like this 51 days is they poured in loud music, they had lights going on, they were trying to, you know, weigh them out and things of that nature. And they did that for a long time. So after that long time, they stopped giving them food after a while, they cut the power. You know, I'm guessing, you know, it probably got hot in there, and things of that nature. But. Well, and another thing, another thing too, I don't I have a poor timeline of this in my mind, but when they when they plowed into, into the house, they had inadvertently broken the, the phone cord, mm -hmm. so then they could not communicate with them. Now, I'll admit now, in their defense, since we've been pouring most of our criticism in, in, in the direction of the government, I will say, if I were in any position of authority and, and decision-making in this process, yeah. once you lose communication with them, I would get a little desperate, because you, then he could be about to shoot every single kid, and you, you would have no idea because you're not able to communicate with him. But at the same time, it's the first thing that's going to pop in my mind if I'm concerned about the kids is, I better toss enough tear gas in there just to make them all lie on the floor in agony. I mean, they even said they put enough tear gas in there that they knew that every single one of them would be on the ground in agony, feeling like their lungs and throats on fire. And that's more or less a paraphrase, almost a quote, I'm paraphrasing, but almost a verbatim quote of what they said. And you think about that, first of all, it's a, it's a trick of our mind. It's, Anyone suffers, right? But just being thought of these innocent children who have no idea what's going on, right? And yeah. they're on the floor in agony like that. I can't help but think the only bad guy here is the person that put that that CO two, the CO two, the, the CS gas in the home. Yeah, it's just senseless to me. I mean, they had first of all, they had no reason to to do that. It didn't do the what? What did they expect it to do? They expected them all to come running out. But even then, that's not the best. Like, I'm not a military strategist, but I feel like that's still dangerous. Even the, um, the not police chief, but the main guy there is talking about, you know, you were, I liked your joke you were saying earlier about the, uh, yesterday about the um, southern accent. You should do that. Oh, yeah. I said I never take consolation in a man with a plan that starts with, all right, plan A is we are going to kind of ask Mr. Chris to step out of the building. Plan B is if he refuses to acquiesce to our claim, we are going to pump that house full of so much CS gas that every single man, woman, and child can be on the ground in agony, grabbing the throat, screaming at the top of their lungs. And plan B doesn't work. And then I, I said, you're going to be really concerned when you hear him say, all right, plan Z. <laughs> when he gets to the end, then what's he do after that? So he just run out of letters, so he just moves on to Greek indices. Plan Theta. He just <laughs> keeps trying everything. It's day 72. Plan Theta. Yeah, but he was like... Um, they just seem so unthoughtful and unsophisticated. I know I sound like a jerk. I'm not saying the accent to him to clarify. Yeah. It's just the, the way they did it seemed unnecessarily aggressive and violent. And it seemed like they just, if they're worried about the suffering of these children, which by the way, they have no evidence for, but if they really suspected it, how are they not contributing more by keeping them up all night for days, playing loud music, terrifying them? I mean, think about it. They said they played music so loud that they couldn't stand in the speakers. They set up the speakers, mm -hmm. went like a mile back and started playing music super loud. I mean, lights flashing. I mean, these kids were probably convinced they were in the, the what the book of Revelation says. They end, I mean, Oh yeah, they're not doing anything but trauma. And you're hearing helicopters. Around. You look outside. You see tanks and shit. Like yeah, that's crazy. Wow, I, I can't imagine. I can't even now. I couldn't even imagine. Like if we were stopping oh, yeah. here and there, are tanks, helicopters flying. We look outside yeah. that window. Whew. And that and that and here we are. We'd like to think we're rational, but even then we'd start to get almost in some sense intoxicated off the delusion of it. It would just just mm -hmm. that becomes so strange. We become we'd start thinking irrationally. Yeah, but they're they're start they're already thinking irrationally. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, that just confirms all of their their crazy beliefs. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's crazy. It is the perfect thing that could have happened for him. I don't know how much he precipitated or instigated it, but it it played right into his claim that he was gonna be there when the end times came. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. 
it's crazy. So. And, and again, if you know the psychology of these people, like, hey, the end of times are hap- going to happen and stuff like that, why would you send so many people, especially just for the arrest? Because yeah. for the arrest, it looked like they had tons of people there. I mean, they had SWAT, it looked like FBI, and local law enforcement, like, there were a lot of people there just on day one, and then they just keep bringing more and more and more. And it sounded like they didn't even want to fight after that. Like, he's like, hey, we, you know, we fired in the fence. My wife, my kids are over here. Yeah. Why would you open fire, you know? Yeah. Yeah, another thing, too, that, that I just, from the beginning of it, cannot wrap my head around is, he, they, they want to bring him in and question him, whatever they're going to do. They're going to arrest him, they can bring him in and question him. They need it because of this, the weapons, right? Or, yeah. Or, it could be for anything. Why would they, they not just go to places they know he frequents, like the grocery store and stuff like that, and get him? And, and st- I mean, as soon as you, even if they would have showed up to his house, they could have showed up two guys, three guys, four guys, and arrested yeah. him. And it would have been far less intimidating. Mm-hmm. But as soon as you show up with 900 people, there's no way he's coming out. And, and here's another thing. Like, there were two FBI agents that were, like, stalking the house yeah, for a while. Yeah, I wonder why they didn't arrest him. And they let him in. He's like, hey, come in. He's like, even in the video where he shot, he's like, you know, he says the two guys' names. like, great guys, you know, really cool guys. I let him in, things of that nature. Yeah, I don't know why you too. didn't, like, you know, get me when I was walking down the road. Why didn't you get me when I was at the supermarket, you know? Like, why did you have to come with all these people? They seemed, it seems, they seemed intent to humiliate him in front of all these people. He had all this power and influence among his followers. It seemed like they just wanted to just humiliate him in front of everybody. Mm -hmm. And I mean, let's, let's just, you know, put yourself in one of the, you know, SWAT or police, local law enforcement, you know, like you're a young guy just going out, you know, You've only been there for a few months. You end up rolling up to this house. You know, there's, you know, you're hearing all this talk of like weapons and stuff like that. This guy's, you know, he brainwashed all these people. He can have sex with any of their, you know, um, wives and stuff of that nature. You roll up, you, you get there. You see this guy like walking out in a white t shirt, you know, long hair. You look at this building. There's probably, my guess is, you know, there are probably some of the congregation already had guns, probably, and they're pointing them through the windows and stuff. You're nervous. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody shoots a shot and just starts shooting. I, you know. Yeah, but I still, and I've, and I've always had this view. I, I do not have the, the, the valor or bravery to be any of the, a Marine or be on a SWAT team or anything like that. It's just not me, right? Yeah. But I feel like if you are that person, I mean, of course, I'm not saying you're not going to be nervous. Everyone's naturally going to be nervous. That's just nature. But I'm, I'm saying, you know, rather than do it the way they did, they could have just, he can't. They can't kill everybody. Just charge it. And they had all those people. They could have just charged it. And mm-hmm. they may have shot a couple, but eventually run out of ammo. You tackle people. You get him. You handcuff him. I mean, they could have done it. But mainly, you can't You can't help but argue that the whole reason why it took so long was because they were that afraid. They, they're afraid of getting hurt. They don't want to stay back and everything. Mm-hmm. They could just charge it. And you may say that's silly strategy. You may say that's terrible strategy. But... It certainly would have worked out better than doing what they did. And that's the thing, like, David Koresh, like, walked outside. He was outside when he was, like, talking to me. If I could see if he's inside with a gun yelling through a window, you know, like, I'm not coming out, but he's going outside. And it's amazing. You, you, whether you, whether you think he's, whatever you think of him, I mean, one has to admire his moxie. He, there's, you could tell when someone's pretending to not be afraid, usually, but he genuinely looked like he just wasn't. It wasn't concerned at all. He seemed so cool, calm, and collected throughout the whole thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I, don't I don't know. It's so strange. How, there's so many things to pick out, and for one, it's so obvious that so many decisions were made just irrationally and quickly and without much forethought. Mm-hmm. And we don't. We're not even professionals, and we're just a couple people just noticing how obviously bad it was planned out. And there, had, there was no strategy, it seems, in anything. It was just, just that guy even said he had a list of options <laughs> if plan A doesn't work. I mean, that's not how leadership should work. You should have a plan that you're so confident in and execute that plan. And even if you have backup plans and everything, but that guy made it sound like they were just rattling off ideas and trying to mm-hmm. stick some tear gas in there. And, and it was just that first, you know, skirmish, you know? Like, yeah, four people 
you know, if four police agents died or if um, AFT died and then six of the uh, Davidians died, you know, in that first gunfire. And then after that, there was nothing. You know, I could see if he kept, you know, there was constant gunfire or something. But after that whole skirmish ended and people are starting to leave the compound here and there, I don't know. We gotta keep talking. This, this, uh, we gotta keep talking about stuff like this. This is so interesting. Mm -hmm. I just find it so fascinating. Even just the idea of, you know, uh, you just want to talk about like how do you get in a position of having that much influence over a group of people? Yeah, and also the the, the cult of personality, the weirdness around it. I mean, I, I personally, if I were placing bets on what I thought of him, right? Just placing bets, like if if if. Someone said, here, I have all the physical evidence about whether he did do these things or didn't do these things. And they said, no place of that. I would bet he probably did do almost all of these horrible things they're claiming he did, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't want to live in a world where if, if somebody just thinks I did something wrong, that my house gets kicked in and I get shot and all these things, that's just antithetical to our our values we live in a secular free society and we value evidence you don't mm -hmm. you know you go to you go to court you don't get sent to prison because you know we're not under sharia law we don't just need three people to accuse us of something we get off we go and so the fact that you have all these people saying he did this he did that but yet whenever they do investigations they get no evidence i mean that's like making a claim about physics, but every time the experiments are done, no evidence comes up, but you're like, well, yeah. I still believe that's not how it works. And so we should apply that same natural science approach to, to evidence of accusations. I mean, in fact, it works so well in both ways. I mean, mm -hmm. you could just as easily sit the same burden of proof is required. So again, you know, whether he did horrible things or not, it doesn't matter. You need evidence. Attorneys mm -hmm. don't fight in court over hearsay. They need mm -hmm. you need evidence. You have nothing else to work with. Yeah. And so, do, did they have evidence? I'm assuming they had evidence about the weapons stockpile. Yeah. But as far as the child abuse, they they brought it up so many times as an excuse to get in. We're so worried about these children. We're so worried about these children. There was even a guy that in the and you didn't know this. But I read this in the the so. So apparently after this all happened, Keep talking, I'm just gonna get a drink. Okay, apparently after this all happened, multiple former members of the Davidian uh, group uh, sued the government for like an insane amount of money, like 600 something million dollars, and did this entirely um, off the premise that the government used this force but didn't really give much of a re like they didn't give an exact reason for why they did it. So they're saying, well, it was because we were worried about the children or it was to stop behind the weapons. And a lot of the members said that there was really, if they were concerned about the well-being of the children, the tear gassing, the, the burning, all these things, it doesn't really add up. So one of the FBI, former FBI uh, officials involved, I guess he ran to the building mm -hmm. and, and was trying to, he said, uh, he asked this woman when he pulled her out where the children she said she didn't know and he said had she told me he said I would have went into that house burning building and I would have either found those children or died trying mm -hmm. to which I said I hope you're not the guy that made a decision to put the tear gas on so if you're so worried about it I know I've just, I'm just repeating this just ad nauseum and again it's not like all those 900 people agreed on it again right. this came from the you know yeah I, I don't know whose first idea it was because it went yeah, all the way up to plan A, guys. I think. All right, guys, plan C, tear gas in the entire building. It went all the way to the attorney general who was uh, Janet, um, Janet uh, Reno, Reno, Reno? Something like that. Janet Reno or whatever. Went all the way up to her and she gave the okay and she talked to, you know, Bill Clinton and he gave the okay and then... They well, we should clarify, I don't think he, I don't think he, I mean, at least officially never acknowledged any decisions in it. Okay. Um, but, I mean, I well, can well, imagine, I, mean, I can imagine that he had, yeah. there was a phone call. It went all the way up to her and she said, okay, with that strategy. Mm -hmm. And then they ended up going and carrying it through. And it sounded like the main guy they talked to, because they talked to like, two of the main police guys and that one guy who was worried about him going in a tunnel rising three days later 
was a guy. Who, yeah, I kind of want to go over this initial. I'm not going to read it, but I just want to kind of glance at this initial the siege because. I keep coming back to this idea that if they wanted to arrest him, why didn't they just wait it out? Wait a couple days, maybe eventually he'd go to the grocery store, eventually he'd go out and get more supplies, and then they'd just grab him and say, you know, and they they cuff him and say, stay calm, we're going to talk to you. Why not just talk to him in there, like saying, hey, we're going to send two people in, or we're going to send one yeah. guy in to talk to him with one unarmed. Yeah. Because, you, you know, you send them in there, they talk, I highly doubt, even if they do take them as captive, you, you're going to know more about these people. You're going to know more, hey, these are people who are going to hold somebody captive. Plus, and that goes back, I, I know I sound terrible, but you might say, well, who's going to risk their life like that? I don't know. There were Marines there, and it's different people. I mean, isn't that their job? I mean, they're, they're so concerned. It just seems like a lot of people concerned about their safety. There's 900 people. I know there's no strategy involved, but they could have charged charged the house and came back with better results than they did. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, so isn't that how it works? Not everyone's going to come out alive, but they can't kill them all. I mean, eventually you're going to have them pinned down, tackled. Yeah, yeah. I, th I just think that you just don't want to be the person on the front of the line when you're charging the house. So let's go. Are there any other things you want to look at that were very questionable? Because like um, the one, I, the one big one I have is like, why didn't you get him another time? He goes into town, he goes out for runs, you know, you know his habits. Why don't you just? Pick well, him you up? know, and I think a lot of the people I saw talking about it were saying, you know, oh well, after, you know, fires out, you have twenty children that are shot and one, you know, something just terrible, hor horrific, and horrendous mm -hmm. you can think about. But yeah. there was a toddler that was stabbed in the chest and all these things. But then yeah. when you think about it, right? They could not have known that was going to happen. So you can't use that what happened in the aftermath mm -hmm. confirmation bias. as yeah. proof to for why they could have gone in the first place. Mm -hmm. Hindsight, you know, like hey, look at they already were shot. Well, yes, you could have never known that. That's and there is I can't remember. There is actually a, there is something. There is a there's a phrase for that. Like for example, I can't. You can't. A police officer can't kick in your door, find a giant bag of marijuana, and then say, okay, here's my probable cause for kicking in the door. Because before they kicked in the door, they could not have known that was there. And even if they had someone that told yeah. them that was there, they never knew that. But anyway. I know there's a name for that, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's crazy. And then, uh, so Wikipedia... Wikipedia says that the medical examiner reported that uh, although the federal government personnel fired no shots that day, 20 people, including five children under the age of 14, had been shot and a three-year-old had been stabbed in the chest, which is, all of it's terrible. Establishing probable cause. Yeah. So I think that's the big thing. And again, the. The FBI, the ATF, like, they did an awful job at this whole thing. Like, I would put more of the blame on their execution of this. Yeah, I would. I would, too. I mean, are you going to... Yeah, you should definitely look into it. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the well, way just, they We did. don't even have to put much of a defense for them because, like you said, they... They brought in all these tanks and everything. It's like they were ready for battle. They could have just... Two guys, two local police officers, could have yeah, just... Yeah, the two guys staying saying, they, could have, they could have just... Yeah. So we should get more about the story, because I know those two FBI agents went in there, but I'm just saying, they went in there, right? Mm -hmm. And they left. Now, they could have just left, and then they could have just went into town, and they could have just spent a couple days in his spots that he goes to frequent, like a grocery store, and they could have just waited it out. Maybe it'd take a week, and when they found him, then they'd pull him aside. Then they'd interview, interrogate him, interview him about... The, the, what, the evidence they have about the weapons that he's been stocked for and stuff like that, right? They mm -hmm. never would have had to go into the home. I mean, going to the home was bad because they knew there was all these innocent people and they got them involved in all this. They could have handled it nowhere near the home. It just seemed like they were bent on invading his home, humiliating him in front of all these people. And that, I, don't, I, don't, I don't get it. Just the strategy on their part was just... I don't know. And then just this whole like back and forth, we're doing it for the kids, we're doing it for the kids. You know, they have gas masks. You know, gas masks are only made for adults. No kids have gas masks. And... Do you think, I often wonder, 
it seems like, you know, when government agencies seem to be very aggressive towards, towards, I mean, he obviously wasn't attempting to form a state, but I'm just saying kind of quell that movement. He was, he was, he was acquiring more and more followers. He, he had a cult of personality around him. He's very charismatic yeah, like and handsome. Yeah, a hundred and you know, like 17. It's not no, 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 I'm just yeah. saying, I feel like in some sense that local law, I'm not saying, I'm not talking about a, a nat- nationwide scale. Oh, from the local standpoint. Yeah, I'm saying we could have felt. Uh, the population of Waco right now, oh, actually I can go back to the 1990s, was 104,000 around there. So 104,000, you know, you have a population of 117 of them. Yeah, it's nothing. Yeah, it's like right. a fraction of one person. Yeah. Um, yeah. I do wonder when I was reading about him, it said that, you know, before he ever got with the Branch Davidians, yeah. uh, that he had gone to some other church and tried to get into a relationship with a pastor's daughter. And I kind of wondered if he was looking for somewhere to kind of take over. Take like over. he had yeah. this idea of like, I'm going to take over. I, I, when I he went to the Branch Davidians, the first thing he did was started spending late nights studying scripture and parsing through scripture with, with that lowest go uh, road and, mm-hmm. and of course maybe that's just what they did yeah you know, I'm not yeah to, you know. i mean she you know took him under her wing and like hey he really understands the bible his analyzation but it is also possible i mean that he manipulated her whether they did anything like he mm-hmm. just you know because she comes out from her experiences in these study sessions with him and, uh, that went on late into the evening and early morning saying you know, he has a good message I want and put put him into just gave him so much responsibility and influence with these people. So it makes you wonder if he went in there with that intention. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't know. And another thing is, is she's like, hey, you know, to the congregation there, because it was a lot bigger. Hey, you guys should really listen to him. He's really smart and things like that. But then her son, who was the um, um, the guy we talked about earlier, who thought he could rise that dead body and got shot and you know, went to jail. Um, he thought he was second in command, going to take over. And he was far more aggressive, it seemed like. He was far more aggressive. Yeah. And he was really radical. The idea that he could raise a body from the dead. Like, it's so fascinating, these people. that he, he. I mean, I guess in this person's mind, this George Rogan or whatever that we're talking about. Yeah. I guess, you know, he thought that's, he, he, he must have thought that he had the creator of the universe on his side and that if he, he, he just challenged them to do it, he'd pull it off, that that, that, that would, that he would, it's just crazy. And here's this, this, the psychology of these people. Certainly crazier than David Crouch, we have to admit that. Oh yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. Crazy. Um, are there any other topics you want to talk about this? Do you want any conclusion, con- Closing statement or anything like that? Um, I like this topic. I think we should go with mm-hmm. stuff like this. I like this. I, I think, just from a character standpoint, David Crouch is an interesting cat. I mean, he, you know, saying he's a prophet, you know, saying all that stuff, going to, did he go to Israel or like Palestine? Like he went somewhere over there. Yeah. He ends up, you know, coming up. He ends Australia. up changing his name to David Koresh, you know, uh, awakening and stuff like that and gets this church and starts talking, he starts getting weapons, things of that nature. Is interesting, but just the, from where he started out, you know, this kid who couldn't talk, you know, was called Mr. Ricardo. You know, ends up doing this whole change, and this, these people looking up to him as if he is a prophet. It's very yeah, it's, interesting. it's that's what's interesting about it. And it'd be, I should clarify: we say you know, powerful man, influential man. Be yeah, just as interesting had it been a woman that did the same thing. Yeah. I mean, per, I would find it just fascinating, if not more fascinating, because it's unique. If it were a woman that had all these male wives or husbands. <laughs> <laughs> 
FY is what we want to say. There's probably some. We should look into that. Yeah, but. that's our next thing. We should look that up. Find a female David Koresh, but and then told all the women that they had to be celibate. But she got to be with all the men. Oh, that'd be just fascinating. But just something about how a person, how a single person is all alone making all the decisions and are in charge of all these people and has all this responsibility. What what makes that so intoxicating for somebody that's so fascinating? Mm-hmm. That's obviously a question people have been asking. I just find it interesting, like how does this one individual or anyone like Hitler, you know, all these people who were basically from nothing came into these powerful situations, like a lot of it's got to be luck, but it's like... You well, know, that's what you're right. I'm glad you said that. That's what makes it interesting, how they go from a relative excu- obscurity to a position of influence. Mm-hmm. And you might say, well, really, is David Crash comparable to those people? No. I do. I think psychologically, yes. I think it takes a certain type of person to just aggressively not just go from nothing to something, but to really to do it that rapidly to just go to, to, to be in charge of all those people. But is that so rapid? I mean, 10 years, 117 people, like, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly not comparing him to Stalin. I'm just saying that it's, I find that interesting how people get, even just to get, I mean, you have to persuade people and you have all these people just, that are mesmerized by your every word when I find that really interesting. Yeah, I, I find him interesting. I find this story interesting. We're going to continue on like just talking about influential people. You know, we're going to go into mobsters. We're going to go into Rome. I'd love to talk about Rome. I mean, probably spent hours talking about Rome and just going into like what makes somebody not necessarily a leader. I guess he is a leader, but when I think of leader, I think of actual like, you know, like when I think of the word leader, I think of like good people mostly. But leader is anybody who shares certain characteristics. Doesn't matter what you know, axiom of good or evil, smart or dumb axioms he's on. What is the? He's a leader, and just seeing how people get into situations like that and how they hold it, because it's not like he held a pretty a strong fist, but not like hey, you can't leave this place. Well, again, yeah, too, and it's not necessarily the force and the violence that's interesting. Yeah, I mean that certainly is an interesting aspect of it, but it's, it's the fact that they persuade all those people to believe they're everywhere, to have such faith and unwavering trust in them that makes it really interesting. Yeah, and so, if anything, they probably were maybe a little iffy on it the whole time, but once they see all them tanks, all those people yeah. out there, they're thinking. Well, I mean, right, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm saying here's an example, right? So like yeah. Hitler's a great example because people, people were just adored and thought his every word was just gold, and I think especially in the 1930s, and I think that. To me, there's just something about certain people. I mean, to be quite honest, we're just talking about sociopaths. We're talking about people that have just enough ability to still get out there and, and, and persuade people and everything. So psychopaths really, they, the way they classify it, is not capable of doing that. Mm-hmm. But sociopaths, like we're talking about those mobsters, they're sociopaths, they're not psychopaths. And I'm not sure some of them are psychopaths, but all, there's just, there seems to be some blurry line that can be put between all of these people but it's it's hard to make it out there's just some some characteristic or Mm -hmm. similarity between all of them it is very interesting so um yeah i don't have anything else i really want to share on this topic i think you know i think if it was done differently with just those two fbi agents coming and talking to him we would have never known the situation i don't think he would have ever you know then no, I think, you know, I think the FBI pushed it further than it could ever go. You know? Yeah. I think that's a big thing. I think, if, you know, they got him, they talked to him, why did you have these weapons? We're stockpiling, what kind of, what's the reason you're going to do anything? No, no, we're stockpiling them, defend ourselves, taking a defensive stance. And they're like, well, okay, well, you can't have these, these, these. We're going to find you maybe some time in prison. You know, maybe in that time, his congregation splits apart. And he just, you know, he settles down with yeah, him. Yeah, I think they should have waited out. I mean, I agree with you. That they should, simply just should have waited out. Him and his kids and go that way about Waited it. them out. Waited, let them run out mm-hmm. of supplies, let them yeah, work. Or maybe he did I have mean, a sinister. he can bring everyone with him to town. They just need to wait wait them out, let them go yeah. to town. He's either going to go by himself or bring his wife or four of the people with him. But the, the point is to have the, the, the smallest amount of collateral damage. So even, you know, and they get him in town. It's not like he's going to start a gunfight with them. I got a question for you. You know, this happened in 1993. Do you think there's people right there? Must be people right now in like certain situations or the same situation with guns, some odd 
out there dogma ideology yeah. shared with a group of people. I mean, they're, they're, you don't know. There could be people absolutely in this town. There could be people, you know, out in yeah. the country who. Speaking of which, I could be home at three. <laughs> make sure no, nothing's gone wrong since I left the compound. <laughs> sure, everything's okay. Yeah, there's something about all. I mean, we're talking about mobs and stuff. There's something about, you know, a secret society, something about John Gotti, yeah. the power he had, the influence he had among these people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, David Crash, there's just some s Hitler, Stalin, you know, the popes and the popes of the Renaissance. It yeah. sounds silly, but you could really just draw some similarities between these personalities of people. I mean, for, for one, many of them are really good at outwardly conveying sympathy, empathy, you know, love and, and, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and just decent values and, and, and yeah. moral you know, principles. But then yet when push comes to shove a cable of doing something horrendous and, and unethical side, I find there's something with that type of person, which I feel like is so much more rare than we think it is. You know, especially the, for that to be that type of person, and on top of them to have the type of of persuasive skills and, and, and you know charisma that some of these people have. Yeah, I think it's a very small few that yeah. carry it. It's interesting, but yeah, I think we're gonna end here. I got nothing else to really yeah. talk about. I think we hit it pretty well. Um, I don't think there's any much we. I think we hit pretty much everything. I can't think of anything yeah. really. And we'll find more topics like this. You know. Yeah, do one where we're less intoxicated. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's pretty much all I got. So you good with that? Yeah.